Do you want ideas for using your 12 by 12 pattern paper without making scraps? Hi, I'm Jess from JessCrafts.com and I'm here to help you make the most of your crafty supplies in time. So let's get making. Today I have 12 by 12 paper busting template for A2 cards number 26, which means there are 25 other A2 12 by 12 paper busting templates over on JessCrafts.com and you can download them all for free. Um, you enter your email each time. This particular one will be the very first link in the video description. You know, that email will get sent out to you with your template. And today I wanted to use a paper that may at first glance seem like how would it work with the template and just kind of show you how I think about some of these papers that are perhaps a little bit more challenging at first glance. So um, to get started today, I am looking at this sketch that shows you or this template that shows you how to cut the paper and in it I put all of these strips them at the bottom you don't need to leave them there they can go at the top instead and that's what we're going to do because I want to save this these really nice tall pretty flowers to be some of these larger pieces so what I'm going to do I'm always going to start off by cutting off the branding strip if there is one because then my measurements will be more accurate. This is Paper Rose Spring Bunnies Collection. I did purchase it a couple months ago but I hope it's still available. I liked it because it is great for Easter but it also has in it some like Happy Mother's Day. Oh, I'll scooch it over a little bit. Happy Mother's Day, Happy Birthday. Um, so some other sentiments in it with the bunnies and just more of a general spring collection, but also great for Easter. I definitely like a little bit more versatility. Okay, so I have my 12 by 12 paper and then I want to start cutting off these strips and it says there are four by three quarters of an inch. So I'm going to cut at three quarters of an inch. That means that I'll bring it to 11 and one quarter and the piece that's left will be three quarters. I'll do that again. I'll bring it three quarters from this side because if I were to try to measure three quarters, first off on this particular paper trimmer, there actually isn't measurements below one or there's like an eighth below. So that's not great. And also having all this amount of heavy paper flopping down makes me less likely to have accurate cuts. So if that's something that you've been doing differently, something to consider. If you cut from with keeping the larger part of the paper still on your trimmer, you will probably be more successful. Okay, so then we're gonna bring it to 10 and a half because that's another three quarters down. And then I can cut these into four inch strips. And these will work for these strips that go behind the oval here. And they're in this nice neutral color. Now this is double-sided pattern paper and that's what's gonna make this work. The back side, which sorry, I hadn't shown you yet, is these florals. So we're gonna, be able to use either as this side of the paper or as the florals. Now we have this left over and our next measurement is five and a quarter, which as you can see, perfectly encompasses those flowers. So some of them will be these florals and some is this plain paper, but there's no like extra floral. So it worked out and you know, of course it's not always gonna work out. You might have a different strip of paper, but I challenge you to, when you're looking at these, maybe there's still a way you can make it work with some of these sketches if you think, you know, if you, you know, mess around with how you cut. So then we're gonna cut these to four inches wide. Don't worry too much about these measurements because they're all in that download. Just like I'm following the exact measurements that are written here, you can do that too. You don't need to memorize them. Now, this, pattern paper does not call for a mat around it. You put this directly onto the card base. If you have a lighter paper like I do, you might prefer not to put it directly on the card base, in which case you can add a mat that is the same size as your card base. You can add an eighth inch mat, which will still leave you a border between that paper and your card base. Or um, you could just use a colored card base and then it won't matter so much that you chose a light color. So then our next step is going to be to cut the ovals out of the center. So our six cards are not gonna be exactly alike, but we are still gonna make six cards and we're gonna take advantage of these beautiful florals. We are going to um, cut, die cut an oval out of them. You'll see here that I suggest about a three by four inch oval cut where you're going to place it on the final cards. But in this case, 
centered. So you're gonna center a three by four oval die cut on top of this pattern paper. In this case, I chose a stitched oval die from MFT. And that means I need to die cut the oval on the side that I wanted to split on my final card. So on my final card, my plan is to actually use the other side of the pattern paper and this will be the oval that goes in the center. So this is the side I want facing up and therefore that is the side I will put my die cut down on. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm trying to go a little slowly about it just so that I am clear. Then for this particular one, I think I actually want my oval to be the more plain piece of paper. So I would then put it on this side of the pattern paper, which is different, so I'm, I won't have the these florals. They'll be the background. Now, you might choose not to do that because you will have this strip is also going to be in the same pattern as the oval. So if you don't want these two similar patterns touching, then that's something you can consider. But there is gonna be a mat between them, or I'm calling for a mat between them. And that's why also I suggest a set of stacking oval dies or stacking shape dies. You can switch this out for a different shape if you wanna use a circle or a rectangle or a heart or anything. Um, a lot of other things could work. But I'm gonna have make sure I have one size bigger so that I can just cut my mat with that. Okay, so I'm gonna do it two different ways and I'm gonna die cut all of my ovals. Now that I've got all my pattern paper cut out, I need to start cutting out some cardstock and mats. This is gonna be a little bit different than my average cardstock mat cutting out because I'm gonna be die cutting a bunch of mats instead of just straight cutting them on the paper trimmer. Now I will need some four and a quarter by one inch mats. And so I always like to highlight a standard piece of cardstock is eight and a half. And so half of that is four and a quarter. So I encourage you to, especially if you have any scraps to look there first, which hmm, I do. So um, I am gonna need more of this, but um, so always start with your scraps. But beyond that, consider that you can use that full eight and a half inch length. So that means that here I have, ooh, that's, of course it's not a round measurement, but I can cut the one inch off and I need six of these. And so that means I need to do that three times because each of these will give me two and I will be able to get that without creating, um, I wouldn't say any additional scraps because obviously this whole chunk of paper is left, but um, I'm not creating any small pieces because I optimized for cutting or starting with an eight and a half inch wide piece. Okay, and then I need to die cut the ovals with the slightly larger oval die, and I'm just gonna be able to fit as many of them as I you know, can across the different pieces of scrap that I have first. This particular set of cardstock, I don't have a lot of scraps. I just have two smaller ones that won't fit one of these ovals. Um, but you know, I do always try to start with smaller bits that I have, especially if I need smaller mats. Now that I have all of my pieces cut, one, I may have some regrets, <laughs> and two, let's look at how I would assemble them. So I was looking at it and I was like, you know, I like the idea is, oh, I was gonna be able to use this paper in the background, but I'm realizing, one, you're not actually gonna see that much of the paper, and it's fine, there's still a way of using a paper that at first glance may not have seemed like a useful one to a card maker. So I can absolutely go forward with my original plan to do the big flowers in the background and the little flowers as the oval or even change it up and do the solid oval on this one and do it like this way on the other one. Like I have lots of choices. Um, I didn't cut any of them. Like the, when I cut these ones with the larger flowers, I did cut them on this little flower side. I kind of like the large flowers, so I kind of regret not just die cutting them there because I was like, well, you know, in my head I thought, oh, but I wouldn't want to stick them down like this. And then I was like, but of course, <laughs> you had all those other ones where you could have used it like this, and how pretty is that? And I wouldn't even need an embellishment. So I think even though technically my stitching is on, on the wrong side, I might just do this. I think it's pretty enough. I think that while, yeah, there's that little like perforation of the paper, it doesn't look bad that way. And it's a really pretty card and I wouldn't have to do anything else to it. In fact, I could 
even change up the sketch a little bit and put this on top of, if you look at the original sketch, I called for this to be behind. I think it could go, definitely go either way. If I put this on top, I could stamp a sentiment there and just be done. So that could be a really cool alternative. Um, and then these ones, I could still use that in the background and then I could be using um, this side, which is cut the right way, or even mix it up and use the other side, which is also technically wrong. But you just really have a lot of options. I think this paper turned out really pretty for this sketch. And it, you know, I encourage you to perhaps go into your collection if you see if you had any of these ones with these large borders and um, see if you can make something really fun with them. So I've assembled all of the cards. And my original intention, because we're nothing if not changing our plans throughout this video, um, was I was gonna add the bunnies from, these are Lawn Fawn Simply Celebrate Critters, I think. <laughs> They're Lawn Fawn Critters. Um, and I was gonna put the bunnies on the card. And I think they're really cute. This one actually has a little bit different mix-up. Anyway, um, I think they're fine. They are definitely a little dark. There's a lot of pastel-y colors, but you know, bunnies are very spring. And I think that for these ones with the large floral in the background, I'll skip the bunnies, but I still kind of like them for these other cards. And so what I'm gonna do is stamp this Hello Sunshine Sentiment at the top onto the three cards that have that configuration and then put the bunnies across. And I will talk a little bit about how I color the bunnies as well. But this Hello Sunshine is just a large stamp from a scrapbook.com Hello Spring stamp set and I stamped it in grape jelly ink from Lawn Fawn. I wanted to add one more thing about um, stamping in colored ink, if you like to do that. I think it's really pretty as a fun way to like kind of add, like tie colors back in and match. And I think that this purple, this grape jelly really matches well with my cardstock in the background. But if you notice, when I first stamp it versus after it's dried for several minutes, the color really changes quite a bit. And so that is one of the reasons I do like to, if I'm really looking for a close match, having my ink swatches can be really helpful. So this is a ink swatch stamp from Lawn Fawn and then these printed labels are from um, Jennifer McGuire and it's jennifermcguireinc.com, I think. I will try to remember to leave a link to these in the video description because they're super fun. She recommends the coin pockets. This is all, you know, her idea in terms of how to store them. But um, I put them on binder rings because the only inks that I have in terms of this kind of inking, sorry, it's sticking to my magnet over there, um, are the Lawn Fawn ink cubes. I try not to have too many because then I get too many options, I get a little overwhelmed. And so I've just dedicated and said, I'm just gonna buy Lawn Fawn. I think there's many other beautiful inks out there, but that is a personal choice. And so having that as a reference so that I know what it looks like when it's dry, even though it will look a slightly different on different colors of card or whatever, I was able to say, hey, when it's dry, it's actually a lot more like that cardstock color. And then that was really true when it dried. When I'm coloring a card or coloring an image for a card like this where like it's not a scene, I don't, I just kind of pick an area for shadows. I don't even make it necessarily consistent across them or anything like that. I just like, if I add a little bit of darkness and lightness to each image, it will make the coloring just look a little more interesting. So I'm starting with my darkest marker and just picking some shadow areas. Also, generally, I'm gonna say I don't want to put the shadow on their face. So I want the lightest area to be where like the creature's eyes are if I'm coloring a critter. And so then I'll go in with a slightly lighter marker and I'll reserve most of my coloring space for my lightest marker. And with them, I kind of start in the darker areas and just sort of I guess try to push the color out a little bit, but like work it a little bit so it, it blends. And this is Nina Solar White 80 pound paper. Um, it, it does work a little better for Copic coloring than just any old cardstock out there. I, you know, I don't want something 
too thin or too thick, like the stuff that I use for my card bases isn't quite as good. And then if you feel like, you know, you blended it out and you lost a little bit of some of your interest, you can always come through and put a little bit more of that darker color back in while everything is wet. You can keep going until you like it. Um, and then I always like to add a little bit of pink here for their ears and their nose. It's not always the most realistic detail, but I think that that adds to the cuteness of them to put pink. Like I know some people like to put like a little bit of blush on them. I don't always, I definitely don't do that very often, but while of course animals don't actually have that look, it makes them look cuter. It kind of brings out a stuffed animal look in them that I think works really well for this kind of abstract animal card making type thing. So, One of the reasons that I like my method of card making where I make multiples of the same card, in this case I'm gonna be winding up, or I'm gonna wind up with six cards, is when I discover something useful like, hey, this particular card stock works well with grape jelly, then I get to use that knowledge across several cards. I'm not just using it one time. Um, even still, uh, for the future, if I were just making a single card and I found this perfect match here, I can take a sticky note and write a note to myself so that next time I pull out this cardstock, I know already that it matches with grape jelly. Of course, I could come back to my ink swatches and rematch it up again, but it kind of could just save me a little bit of time to have that note in there and, you know, have an extra benefit of this little card making session. Now, for the other three cards, I don't want this large Hello Sunshine sentiment because it would you know, be right there with the flowers, but I also don't really want to pull out another sentiment. So I'm thinking that I'm going to use Happy Spring. I'm trying to avoid Easter, even though I'm using bunnies and a very Eastery paper line, uh, because these cards are a little bit more useful to those who I might donate my cards to. So. On JessCrafts.com, there's a whole web page where you can find different places to donate your cards. But, um, and I donate a lot of my cards, so I want to them to be the easiest for the organization to use. And for Happy Easter, Easter can be a religious holiday. Um, and so, you know, it limits who they could give the card to. They'd have to know if they celebrate. And then on top of that, it gives them you know, one day or a certain period of time, uh, a smaller period of time where they could give the card. Whereas if I put a happy spring card, now they can distribute this anytime throughout the spring, early spring or late, etc. Um, and it would be more useful. Or the hello sunshine can be given all year long. Even spring, I guess, is a little bit more limiting, but I'm hoping, you know, each season is approximately three months of the year. So it's certainly better than a, or, you know, easier to use than a happy Easter sentiment, but there was also in the stamp set, happy birthday and you're amazing. You're amazing could be great for coming again and it's really an any time of year sentiment. If you're enjoying this idea of like how to use your 12 by 12 patterned paper to really like make the most of it, make a bunch of cards all at once, kind of what I do here, um, I am teaching a class on 12 by 12 paper busting at the Card Maker Success Summit in the spring of 2024. So um, I will be giving you an exclusive template that you'll be able to get during that free class and then um, it's not going to be available otherwise uh, or maybe part of a paid resource in the future but like it's you know it's not going to be just on my channel um, and so you can sign up for a free ticket there is an option to upgrade and to get you know instant and um, ongoing access to it. And there's a bunch of bonuses. I'm giving out uh, my card inserts. So I, if you want to have like things that you can put inside your cards, like games and coloring sheets and mazes and fun stuff like that, because you also like to donate your cards and you thought, oh, it'd be fun if they have a little something extra. Those are included as my freebie for the summit, but when you get the all access pass. And other designers have other all-access resources. They might be printables or F SG 
SVG files or classes, like extra classes and all kinds of cool stuff happening. So definitely worth checking out because again, like you can, you can just watch it for free on the weekend of the summit. There is 48 other, or 48 instructors, so 47 other instructors also. And so I just think anyone should get their free ticket and just check it out, see if it's worth it. There's a Facebook group, etc. So yeah, it'll be fun. I think I had a good time um, at other summits. This is my first time teaching at the Cardmaker Success Summit, but I've heard nothing but good things. So I, I hope that uh, you'll give it a check out and you know at least get that that free ticket. And that's going to be it for my six cards with one sheet of kind of challenging 12 by 12 pattern paper and no scraps. If you found this video helpful, here's another video where you can find more ideas for enjoying your crafty time and supplies. If you like this video, please share with your crafty community and subscribe or click the bell so you don't miss the next template or tutorial. You can check the video description for product links and for that link to your free ticket for the Car Maker Success Summit, and I'll see you in the next video.